All right, all right. We are here with Tudor Matei, one of the great friends and former co-workers. We both worked at Course Hero for a while together in a team. And recently I noticed he has been switching to doing coaching for engineering uh, folks. And it's been exciting to catch up in the past few uh, weeks. And I asked him to uh, show up on the show. So welcome to there. We would love to uh, get a, this conversation started with you by introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about your story. I mean, I, I know some of it, but I'm so excited for everyone to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Um, so yeah, my name is Tudor. Uh, I've been working 15 years in the tech industry, all kinds of startups and um, small businesses. And uh, my journey really began as a software engineer. Well, journey really began as uh, loving computers when I was young and uh, playing games, um, playing in, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, programming languages and um, everything from like QBasic, Visual uh, Basic, like super uh, elemental stuff. Um, and then in high school, I really started taking it seriously with like AP courses that I was taking for computer science. And then it's like, okay, I think that I can do this as a career. This is, uh, this sounds fun. So I went for a CS degree and uh, got my CS degree, then went and got my master's too, because I thought, you know, this is the path to go and do things. So that was my um, plan. I've, you know, finished that. And then when I went into the industry, I started um, working at these small companies. And at Course Hero was the first place that um, I really wanted to give management a try. And uh, with management, it was, um, you know, I came in there with uh, the hopes that I could get into management as soon as I could. And then um, the position was opened up. We had a lead program in there, which uh, helped us train um, as managers. So myself and another person went through that program. Um, it was super useful to understand what it's like to um, learn some of the soft skills. What is it like to have one-on-ones with people? Uh, performance reviews. So everything except like HR and dealing with money related things and vacation was done through that uh, program. And um, it was like the best six months of learning experiences that um, I got the opportunity to learn what it's like to be a manager and then have that choice at the end if I want to be a manager or not. And um, ironically, you know, the other person I was with in the program decided to stay in IC and really loved just being IC, you know, wanted to try management and it wasn't for them. And I think just having that choice was really uh, powerful. So that's one thing, you know, I want to do for others as well. But, um, you know, just going back a little bit to, um, you know, I got to, a, you know, senior engineering manager and director um, at Course Hero and was a layoff that happened last year in December that I was part of. And, you know, initially I thought that was something that was so like, it was, it just came out of nowhere almost, you know, taking a look at back that, that was like the best thing that happened to me. And um, I didn't realize how stressed I was at work and how many meetings I had, you know, I was probably like 80, 90% time in meetings. And, um, you know, I just didn't have time for anything else. And I really sat down and thought about uh, what can I do? What is it the next stage for me? And, um, you know, actually, Ali, you were the one who um, kind of, you know, I started talking with you as well in that time frame, and I noticed, you know, you're, you're doing your own thing. You got a little bit out of tech um, industry. And so I was thinking one of the things that I really enjoyed was just being like coaching other engineers, you know, started with mentoring and then I started doing coaching and I really enjoyed seeing that career progression and seeing my engineers and engineering managers just have that, uh, like seeing their inner essence of how they can build that by themselves with my help. 
so I was just a guide, you know, instead of just telling him what to do at every step of the way, I give him, hey, these are the guidelines that you have to meet. How do you want to achieve them? How do you want to do this? And um, I think that really resonated with people and um, it's helped their career uh, make that progression. So I said, hey, you know, when I try to do this as my own business, so I started my own business in coaching and I've uh, been doing that since. So that's kind of my story on how I got here. That is, uh, in so many ways, I, I have a lot to say. I think one is what I remember from uh, the time that we worked together. You had a very specific uh, management style that um, I know for a fact. By the way, Dennis says hi. He told me to tell you. He says hi. Um, I I remember like engineers really loved to get your coaching and kind of like your uh, straight to the point sort of uh, engineering management. But at the same time, you had kind of like you always had their back, but very straight to the point. That's one thing I vividly remember. The other thing is like um, I also can recall like how much we both and sometimes separately spend times in meetings, which was draining for myself. Like looking back, just like what you were saying, like it was such a draining experience, not for, not just for managers or like uh, folks who are responsible about delivering a project, but also like, honestly, like for anyone who was a stakeholder, it was t time spent on uh, meetings, both during COVID, which we went uh, remote. And also like when we were in person, it was just like such a, um, tough time for me personally to handle all those meetings. I know there are people out there who have no problems with back-to-back -back meetings. I figured, now looking back, I figured I actually have problems. And now that I have more control on my time, I am able to like separate these times and sometimes planned, plan easily no meeting day for myself, plan no meeting month for myself. Like last month was like a no meeting month for me. So um, I kind of want to tap on that a little bit. Like, as an engineering leader, how do you think like folks should be thinking about uh, managing their time in a tech environment? Because this can be really impacting their mental health, and that's as a matter of fact why I care about this topic here. What What is your perspective on that, and what are the tools you would recommend to manage that time? Yeah, actually, it reminds me of a video I just saw uh, from Alex Hormozzi, and he was talking about maker time and creator time, and um, it was super useful, and it really opened up my eyes on what it's like. So he basically was talking about um, creators, like the managers who have um the their schedule is based on how many things can I fit in if I have empty slots. I'm probably not the most efficient manager. And um, the creator's time is people like who, who are in IC or um, you know, making videos, they're doing things outside that re requires deep focus. So having a certain amount of time set aside and not being interrupted by that time. So I think managers and ICs tend to have different kind of schedules that are needed, and it's important to understand their schedules like that. Um, so, example for my team, uh, I try to schedule a lot of the team meetings and things within certain blocks of time, and um, we'd have like meetings in the morning um, on Mondays, and then I'd leave note meetings for them on Tuesdays so that maybe they can focus, and then we had no meeting Wednesday. Uh, so doing things that they can chunk out at a certain time that they can focus, write code, you know, come up with documentation, new ideas. You know, we have to be able to brainstorm from teams. It's important to have those uh, focus blocks. So as a manager, my schedule was totally different, which was <laughs> let's see how much I can fit in my uh, day because um, I'd rather just get those out of the way and uh, make myself, I had a no meeting Wednesday, which if anybody uh, scheduled on that, I'd be like, Try another day. <laughs> so uh, for my team, it was every Wednesday. For the company, it was every other Wednesday. We were trying out that aspect. And uh, that really worked out well. And I think a lot of team members really appreciated that, especially since um, conversation had, were on Slack. And uh, as a team, we decided, you know, the SLA is about two hours on Slack. 
Um, so we didn't have to get back to each other immediately. So it'd give them some, some of that extra time for them to uh, focus and not have to respond to messages. So you designed a two hour delay for uh, messages on Slack. Is that is that what I heard? Because I didn't catch that properly. No. So basically what I allowed my team to do is basically turn off the notifications on Slack if they want for an hour mm. or two. And if it was something important, I can mark it as urgent and send it and notify right away because there's that option. But oftentimes nothing is really that urgent. So, you know, then I can send them a message when they get back, they'll look at it. And um, there's no need for that uh, checking emails, checking Slack, and they can just focus on their work. It's very helpful to hear that detail here because I remember... I'm trying to remember exactly the time that we were working in person in offices, not just in our company, but other places like Slack was just a place for me to put my thoughts and, or maybe just share a link or, um, I don't know, like share a document that I want someone to review, share a design back in the design time that I wanted someone to review or send a screenshot. Like it was just a place to have a wall of thoughts and broken discussions. And the rest of the discussion was for me was happening in person. If it was that important of a conversation, I could walk and I could just go to that person or I like to respect their boundaries. I could say, okay, I know they have meeting it or it's, it's their morning. I will go there in an hour or two. If I don't hear anything, it was that sort of an experience for me before COVID hit and everything went remote. But when COVID hit, I felt like one of the most frustrating thing for me um, at work was just getting all those Slack notifications. And I just always felt like, and given my role, I felt like I have to react to this so quickly. This engineering manager is looking for this answer. The C-level is looking for this answer I have. And that urgency was so hard for me to even prioritize. So th this process that you develop with your team seems kind of like mimicking the real work environment that we used to have, like the message is there. They will look at it in an, in an hour or two if they want to. And then if it's urgent, I will push the urgent notification. It's like, if it's urgent, I will walk to that person's desk to yeah. talk with them about this thing. So I, I really uh, like that. And uh, I wish I would have implemented it for my teams. Uh, one of the other thing you mentioned was like experience of layoff. You felt you felt at the time that, oh yeah, it was a shock. I it came out of nowhere, but then it was like the best thing happened to you. Can you tell us a little bit more about this duality here? Because at the same time, it's like very shocking. Maybe it comes with some pain or I mean some stress, of course. And then you f you figure out this is the best thing. I want to know why there is this duality and if you can describe it. Yeah, definitely. So it, I was working at Coursera for five and a half years. So that was the longest place I've ever been at. And um, I worked in um, the document uploading um, side of things, which um, it was sort of like job security in a way. And because the we you know the site would always need somebody to upload documents uh until chat gpt decided to uh just <laughs> change the entire course kind of like covid uh for ed tech companies you know chat gpt just kind of uh <laughs> changed the whole layout um so it, it was just interesting that like it, it came as a shock because i didn't think that they would get rid of um my teams and restructured that drastically um, as a company. But, um, you know, that said, um, after the shock um, came off, it was just like, okay, what do I do now? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to do because I haven't done anything to my resume. I haven't, I haven't even been in the job search and I knew the market wasn't that great. And uh, I started applying and I going through that whole process um, for, I think it was like two and a half months. And then, um, they got a couple of interviews, things like that. And it was just, just draining, uh, the whole process and in, there's a book called never search alone. And, um, I don't know if you've heard about it, but uh, they formed like these JSC groups. And, uh, one of the things that you do in there as a team, 
um, you get together with other people and uh, do job searching together and, you know, f help each other in whatever ways. And one of the things was a Moonkin two pagers in there, which focused on the things that I love, things that I don't like, uh, things that um, I'm passionate about. And that's where coaching came from. So for me, that was actually the turning point where it's like all these things are not things that I'm looking from um, the engineering uh, workload that I'm doing. I mean, I love working with engineers and why can I do just coaching uh, with them and learn from them and the way they've uh, done things. So that turning point happened for me and it was um, it was liberating and uh, it was just something that I could take and um, have some kind of control. So for me, it was about being able to take control of my life back again, instead of leaving it up to um, somebody else by working for somebody else. So, but it's definitely been challenges and uh, trying to be one person business is super difficult, um, but I'm working through it. I know from at least my own research so far, this is a by observation. I don't have like massive number of data points here, but folks who end up in coaching and find that path in coaching, uh, there's at least two things in common between all of them. Um, one is someday they had a very good coach that inspired them, or at least as a role model. And then two, uh, there's a story behind it. There is a, there's a story behind why they care about helping people and see them grow. So I want to start with the first one. Um, if you had a good role model and a good coach in life who inspired you or that, or someone that you've been looking up to, uh, in that perspective. Yeah. So that actually was, uh, my boss, Halle. Um, she's you, amazing. If you got it. Yeah, she's amazing. And I'm glad you got to meet her before uh, you ended up leaving Coursera. Um, you know, it initially started off with a good relationship as a mentor, and she's helped me pave the way to um, director. And, uh, you know, we got there together with her help. But one thing she started doing about a couple of years ago is uh, starting taking coaching uh, classes at Berkeley and um, she got a certification and um, all kinds of things. And um, she started implementing that in our one-on-ones. And, um, you know, we had weekly one hour one-on-ones, like, um, and we were talking the whole time and it wasn't status updates. Um, you know, I can give that to her anytime. It was uh, not important. And we had really good conversations on, um, she was working with that, you know, mentoring me and things, but it, eventually turned into coaching and I really enjoy that. And that's how I ended up using coaching for my team because I saw that impact that she was making on me. Um, so then I can do that the same thing to my teams as well. So yeah, that was, uh, that was the person who's inspired me on that. That's amazing. And just for folks who don't know her, cause uh, I was lucky to know her. I think we almost worked for uh, about a year, uh, while I was there. Um, what was it special about her style? Like, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about like, what, what made Halle the special person and the special coach that um, is a role model to you? I think she was always looking for what's best um, and finding your strengths. So she would work on finding the strengths and focusing on those. And whenever you had any kind of mindset um, pitfalls, she would challenge those and, figure out why, why are you thinking that way? Why do you think, um, you know, you have these maybe intrusive thoughts or imposter syndrome. So, um, I think it's whenever I felt down in any kind of way, it was almost like speaking with a therapist, um, where she would help me get over that and, you know, be able to lead the teams again. So I, I think that was really powerful. That's interesting. And, I think in in my experience, uh, I also always admired the coach and managers or mentors um, who didn't use those times we had for status updates. I remember I had a very good manager and 
he was using most of our one-on-one times just to like go through our plan to like, hey, what's missing if, I, if I'm going to be uh, growing in my role or what I'm going to be doing, what are the missing parts, what are kind of some of the tensions I feel like in my personal or professional life. So he was like really caring about that. And he was really good at, at the, on the other hand, he was really good with getting status updates from his team. He had this organized process of like, here's this document, here's that. Every Monday, every Friday, there was very specific plans for those days to get those status updates offline, managing multiple uh, product managers. Uh, And then at the same time, using that time. I think having that balance is very special, seeing it in in managers and mentors. Um, Now, switching to the second part, I want to know what's your story and I'm guessing, or I'm hoping it's also related to some of the stories that you want to share uh, about the story of your, your mental health, because this is uh, the mission of this podcast. Uh, so if you want to share anything, we would love to start hearing that story or that, um, uh, anyway, that story that you want to share with us. Yeah. So um, in terms of mental health, that's been definitely kind of a challenge. Um, and it's had its up and downs. And um, I think I've been working on my mental health a lot since the layoff. And that's another reason why I think it's been really powerful, where it's sort of like I'm discovering myself um, again. And uh, I don't know if Ali, you had that uh, kind of same thing when you've left your job. But it kind of gives you something to think about um, when you're not constantly thinking about all the work that needs to be done and keeping your focus on the company. So I've done a lot of research on um, like brain and like how can I change it and you know the whole neuroplasticity and all that. Um, and I've for me it has to make sense. It has to make logically sense. I can't just say, you know, I've heard things like. Well, just tell yourself positive thoughts. That doesn't work on me. And uh, I wanted to figure out why that was. So I actually took a journey on that and, um, you know, looked a little bit into the whole brain, how it works, and that we don't have a fixed mindset. And, you know, how can we rewire it? And uh, for me, the most important thing that I found out was that um, first you have to be understanding of what are you looking for? and why so um for me it was i want to find myself and what's really important and um then i said okay i need to focus my attention on this uh piece and taking action and for taking actions a lot of it was um make sure i'm hitting my goals and uh, my goals were right now i need to um, get my business going. I want to make a certain amount of money to make sure that I'm not going to go broke, right? Over uh, time, just being a coach, right? Um, And there's a lot of imposter syndrome there um, that came up and I've had so many ups and downs. And um, I, again, uh, thank Halle, um, even after the layoff, we were actually both laid off at the same time. She started her own coaching business and Um, She's been coaching me since uh, that time. So um, I've had a really good coach uh, even past that. So I think that's been super helpful in my mental health. Um, But in terms of practice, what I've done is um, not necessarily telling myself, oh, you know, this is what I need to do. And uh, telling myself positive thoughts, I've realized doesn't work because I actually have to believe in it. And um, for me, what's really worked is using the word could. I could do this. Let me try. Not necessarily be like, oh, I'm going to do this. I, I, I need to do this. Because if I put those words in, it really doesn't help me in any way because I don't know if I believe it. So, But in could, this is a possibility. Why don't I try it? So that was... That was my side of things. And um, what's really helped with a coach is that whole accountability side of it, because now I had somebody who was accountable. So uh, within our session, so she was like, all right, so in the next week or next two weeks, what are you going to 
do what are your actions that you're going to take and now is telling somebody you know i'm going to do these things and they're holding me accountable so then i would be asked you know why didn't you get them done and then you know try to dig deeper and further with that that's uh something that we also love it here uh, this concept of keeping each other uh, accountable or having accountability partners and we'll get to that in the end of this conversation and i want to ask you about that um i am wondering what are some of like specific um actions you took like since you started these conversations and how did they change what you're doing and how you're doing them so one thing i've started doing is i wanted to exercise for a long time and um you know i'd force myself to get on the treadmill we have a treadmill in the garage and i'd force myself to do it and um, didn't really work out i said okay i'm just going to put a tv show we have a tv in there too so put in a tv show and you know go on the treadmill it was still not working for me I tried doing weights. I set up a whole weights uh, station and, uh, okay, maybe if I do something that's more of my muscles, didn't really work uh, that well. And then um, everybody's been pushing me, just just go outside for a walk. And I was like, that's so boring. I, I don't know if I want to waste my time doing that. So I was like, okay, I need to do it. And I got myself to do it. Um, walked around the block once, no, no, nothing new happened. So then I put on some uh, of the headphones, not the ones that cover my ears, but, you know, just around that um, can also help you hear. And I was listening to podcasts and um, that's, you know, kind of how I was listening to your podcast as well and um, catching up. And I was doing that and I realized this is actually kind of enjoyable. I am. I'm getting, you know, stuff down because I don't feel like I, I'm still listening to something. I can still hear the nature and, you know, the birds, wind, everything else. And it's about the scenery. So for me, it's about, and I have a path that I take around my neighborhood that I just enjoy. There's not a lot of cars. There's just a lot of greenery, uh, birds, you know, trees everywhere. So it, for me, the one thing that's helped I would say the most is just going for a walk and enjoying 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever, you know, it's not timed. Uh, I can do whatever pace I want, listening to something and uh, having that visual aspect of not looking at a screen. Mm, interesting. Cause for someone who is an engineer, um, we, we, if I would say like we spend a lot of time, looking at the screen, like being in those sort of roles, like whether you're a um, software engineer, manager, product manager, designer, like you're consistently looking at the screen. So you figure having that space and actually going at the different scenery that is not the screen of your laptop or uh, bigger screens, that's kind of like the action that's ha that, that can help you uh, go forward with that mental health pass. I don't want to also miss on that, however you want to share about it, but were you able to kind of like tap into that imposter syndrome and understanding where that comes from? What's the story around that? And how have you been managing to um, kind of like get improvements on that imposter syndrome? Because it's a very common thing that I know a lot of us are dealing with. So I think it would be good if you can shed a little bit of a light about if you figured the root cause and also what you're doing for that. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the most important thing that I figured is um, it, it's an ongoing thing. Um, and uh, I've been listening to some you know, podcasts and books, and it's not something that goes away. It's just different levels of imposter syndrome. And for me, one thing that's helped me lower it is just challenging my beliefs. Um, for example, like, can I get on this podcast? So this is actually my first podcast that I'm being a guest on. So it's, uh, it's a big uh, step for me. It's one of those things that, um, you know, can I do it? Maybe. Yeah, I think, you know, I can, but, um, you know, I challenge myself to like, what would happen if I didn't, you know, I would probably miss out on a good conversation with you and having a deep, uh, meaningful like connection. 
and then like I can share my story with you and the world and everybody else. So, you know, I try to focus then on the benefits that I can get uh, by focusing on, you know, what would I miss out on and challenge those beliefs of imposter syndrome that are causing that root cause and seeing, you know, what, what would happen if you didn't? Um, I mean, there could be some positives there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if anything, if I want to add on top of it, it's like not even positive. It's, it's something that came our way. It's an opportunity. I can just see how it is. If I'm interested, if I'm not, I can say no, you know, like oftentimes I think we have that answer. Hey, Ali asked me to jump on this call for an interview. Do I feel it? Do I not feel it? I feel it. So I just want to go and see what it is. And I think even putting a lot of pressure on and expectations in advance that I'm going to get something positive out of this may even already just trigger something with that imposter syndrome. Whereas you said earlier, oh, I'm just going to have a great conversation with a friend. Hi, that's it. And then you never know, a lot of great things may come out of it, or you may actually not enjoy that. And the good thing is, next time you want to do a second podcast, you know, you shouldn't do it with these sort of, uh, uh, let's say, interviewers or podcasts. And then you start defining your standards. And I think no matter what, like, there is like that moment that somebody tells you, let's do this. I think instantly we have the answers. There's just that feeling that we have it and we just have to call it. And I appreciate that you called it, by the way. Uh, one thing I would say, uh, the one thing that's helped me was having it scheduled. Um, and I know we scheduled it in far ahead uh, time. And actually, I thought it was a week ahead. So I was like, oh, I can relax. And then all of a sudden, oh, I can't. But, you know, I actually didn't need to prepare or anything for it. Um, but having it scheduled was really helpful in saying, okay, I'm committed to this. You know, this is my accountability to Ali. Uh, that's helped me. I can really relate to this. Like one of the things that has been really helping me is to just schedule, for example, these calls, schedule my other recordings that I have for my Farsi uh, meditation podcast, and then scheduling a few things, more regular check-ins with folks that I'm working on some things with. Like that has been super helpful for me also to get on that. So that is schedule thing. I just want to double tap. Uh, love it. Uh, I also want to tap again on kind of like this root cause because we, we talk about imposter syndrome and everybody may even put that label on themselves. I want, I'm curious um, if you think there has been in your lifetime, if there has been triggers that created that imposter syndrome, or if, if you figure it out and what helped you to figure it out? That's a good question. I think most of the imposter syndrome comes from stress, at least for me, and stressful situations that make me challenge my thoughts if I can do this or if I have enough experience. And, um, you know, like, um, you know, eventually I want to coach, um, you know, directors and execs, you know, I haven't been one, right? Can I do this? And, you know, I'm working my way there, right? Uh, to try to get that courage. Um, but it's, I think it leads a lot of the stress in the past that's caused um, these imposter thoughts that come in and questioning my credibility or ability to do these kind of things. So there's been events that uh, created this feeling or this memory that, oh, yeah, I, I may fail this or may, I may not be able to do it. Then every single time or every other opportunity that that situation may arise, you, that feeling uh, is going to be seen. Are there specific events that you think they have had like the biggest impact on creation of this imposter syndrome for you? Yeah, I think honestly, any negative thoughts that were said to me or um, mentioned, um, a lot of times it doesn't really happen from other people. It's I interpret something maybe more negatively than it was said. And then that creates, it almost feels like um, it creates like a new pathway. 
and just kind of reading on the whole neuroplasticity and stuff it's like that pathway is so set in my brain that it is you know the brain tries to take the easiest path to that and um you know the least energy that it can take and that is the easiest path for me and i'm trying to work on that to create the new path but it's it's like it uses a lot of energy and a lot of times on those days i just feel drained by the end of the day but i know i'm making progress so that's that's kind of my indicator at the end of the day if i am feeling just uh not stressed but um out of energy mentally then i know i've been training my brain to do a different path and it's a different way of thinking do you also in your past experiences and even in your coaching experience do you also notice that in the engineers who are working with you how do you recognize it what are some of the signals how do you recognize it and how you react to it as a mentor and a leader yeah i think honestly with the engineers it starts with building that trust and vulnerability with them so that they can be open because if the engineers can't be open with you and have a conversation they're never going to say oh i'm overwhelmed i'm stressed um i don't know if i can do this they're just going to say okay i'll do it you know and kind of put their head down and um try right their best i'm actually more interested in their challenges and um what are they trying to overcome rather than the things that they can do because I can tell the things that they can do. Um, you know, every day they're showing it through their work and I'm happy to reiterate it to them as, you know, something that I've noticed that um, they're doing it. But I'd rather have that knowledge of what is it that drives you to become better and um, how did you overcome those kind of things and, you know, helping them through that process. I'm trying to understand what, what does that conversation look like? Imagine... I'm an engineer and I feel for whatever reason, I feel I'm not able to take on some task or I feel I'm not enough and I have that imposter syndrome kicking and we have a one-on-one. -on -one. Do you have an example or like, can you tell us, understand a little bit of like what that conversation looked like? What are the things that you may hear? What are the things that you would say or react or put as action items to kind of like manage that because I feel like it's one of those situations that a lot of us get into at work and like really mimicking it would be beneficial for both folks who are mentors and mentees so if you can mimic that a little bit that would be uh, very helpful for me to understand this better yeah I mean uh, let's say I think we can all relate to um, doing presentations that's usually something that's difficult for all of us, but especially, you know, engineers who are just kind of at their computer all day. Um, and it's about trying to understand what is the root cause of the imposter syndrome that they have. Is it, you know, I'll ask questions like, um, what's making you think that way? And if it's related to things like, you know, I just don't think I have the knowledge um, to do this, then we can focus on, okay, so what do you know so far about it? And then what do you think you're missing? And then when you're missing that information, you know, how can I help you, um, you know, gain that? Or, you know, how can I help you um, finish those? You want to review those slides with me, you know? Um, and if it's, let's say if it's, you know, for the presentation with people, it's like, well, maybe you can, you know, what are some ways that you can feel more comfortable? Do you think that practicing it with me would be helpful? Or uh, do you want to record yourself and watch it back? Um, you know, what are some ways that work for you? So it's about figuring out for them what is the best way uh, and challenging those thoughts in such a way that um, it's not threatening to them. It's, just, it's about finding out why that's happening for them specifically. I think there's a very fine line, and I'm glad you brought it up. There's a fine line between threatening and that feeling of being threatened versus that feeling of being heard and challenged. How do you manage that fine line? Because I've seen it in my case, and I've heard it, of course, from folks that they felt both. Sometimes a manager 
seemed a little bit threatening. Sometimes a manager seemed challenging. Yeah, I know it was uncomfortable for me, but I was challenged. I didn't feel threatened. How do you manage that fine line as a leader in a conversation? I think it's choosing the right words to use in the context. So a lot of times I'd use some things like, I noticed this happen. You can tell me more about it. it instead of saying, I saw that you were in that meeting and um, you were being condescending, right? <laughs> um, I could be like, I noticed uh, there was some tension in that meeting. You know, are you okay? Right. Starting with what's going on. Maybe there's something that's uh, causing. And then, you know, if they open up, great. You can continue down that line. If they don't, you know, just challenging that and saying, you know, um, I've heard from some people that this, um, they felt this way or that way. It's about kind of, nobody can challenge feelings, right? If I'm feeling a certain way or if somebody else is feeling a certain way, it's not under their control to change that, right? So they don't feel as threatened. So for me, it's about giving some context, but, you know, things that maybe I feel or somebody else has felt um, that really helps. Uh, it resonates with me in a way that, um, to your point, like what you can challenge feeling. There's also this fine line of, and I'm going to be uh, a little bit descriptive here to, to get an answer uh, or to kind of like shift this to this, uh, to this thing that I have in mind. So please bear with me. There's a fine line between thinking something, for example, I've had managers that I can say they were very pissed in a specific moment, but they were trying to choose the right word versus I've had managers that they genuinely seemed curious about why I did something the way I did or why I said something the way I said. So how do, how do you also encourage or how do you think folks can really... Um, choose which path they're on because i think for engineering managers they should also or for managers in general they should also know that am i really thinking something and trying to find the right word or am i really curious what what are some of the tools you would recommend for managers to observe themselves at that moment and maybe be aware of what choices they are making? You know, um, you actually kind of you actually gave away the answer <laughs> while you were uh, talking without even knowing. Um, but you know, at least from my side, it's it's coming from a sense of curiosity, and that's when I challenge myself. Of you know, am I coming from a place of curiosity and trying to figure out is this person doing this or that, or are they? you know, uh, just stressed out, um, you know, what's really happening versus telling them what's going on or uh, telling them, you know, what's right or wrong or things like that. Because then you just become this authoritative um, person that's just telling people what to do. And that's not what people want in managers. What are some of the practices you would recommend for managers who may notice this that, oh, it seems like I've been authoritative sometimes with my team. What are some of the practices that you would recommend for those folks? I think it's really about looking at yourself and figuring out what kind of leader you want to become. Because if you do want to become that leader, that's fine. You know, it's, it's, it's about how you want to live your life, right? So I'm not here to tell you how to lead. But if you're looking to become better as a leader, I think it's important to reflect on one-on-ones that you have with people and how you approach situations. And like I said, like you said too, um, just coming from a sense of curiosity and um, understanding the true like issues that people are having and getting to a root cause rather than just having this, you know, like, oh, I assumptions that are being made a lot of times because as a manager, I think, 80% of the time I'm using my gut, but if that 20% of the time, I don't want to be wrong in that scenario. I'd rather confirm it um, and kind of come from that sense of curiosity and uh, confirm my gut rather than, you know, saying, oh, I really think this is happening. This is interesting because 
the fact that there is a different, there is a uh, big difference, like 80% versus 20%. There are things that we can use our guts, but then we can be more efficient for that 20%. We can have more time. We can spend more time for figuring out those 20%. And maybe again, maybe I'm just coming up with an idea here, but maybe that's why those one-on-ones exist. Maybe that's why those in-person times exist because those 80% of the time we figured it out on Slack or other conversations, like briefly and boom, boom, check, check. But that 20% of uh, cases, then I have more time. So it's, it kind of like tells me like, doing a lot of like these micromanagement and like, trying to like be available for all those decisions or all those incidents. That's efficient because you can't really highlight those 20% cases that require these more cur- curious eyes of like, oh, okay, I want to, I, this seemed like this. I, I want to know more about that. How did you feel in this case? Or how did you feel in that meeting or about that pu- a code that we pushed a few days ago? That really gives you that deep conversation and respecting both sides in that. So I, this is what I conceived from what you were saying. It, does that resonate? Uh, with you. Yeah, it does. I think the one difference that I see is um, micromanagement seems to be based on trying to be in control uh, and trying to control the situation, showing that you're a leader and, um, you know, you, you got this, right? You know, through my experience, it's been, I've noticed that you really, you're rarely in control. I mean, as a leader, you're paving the path and you're showing people how to do things. And um, I've learned that letting go is actually more helpful. Um, for example, like micromanaging um, started, you know, initially I wanted to do sprints a certain way. I wanted to do designs and conversations, a certain flow. And then I started letting go of that. And um just having the engineers were leading that. So one thing that came out of that is I saw a different perspective. I saw, you know, a different way of doing things. And um, I've actually learned something new. And I think just giving up that control is hard. But once you do it, it's so powerful because you are learning so many new things that some you know, you wouldn't have if you were had that fixed mindset. So it's shifting to that kind of growth mindset. That That's a good differentiation. And I appreciate you calling that out. So I kind of like mixed two topics. One, one was like efficiency in those conversations <laughs> and then micromanagement. In my head, someone who has oftentimes been managed, I haven't done much of, much of management. So it's it, it, that's how I look at it. In my head, uh, folks who are, assuming too much, like managers who feel more threatening, there are also oftentimes, there's a correlation. There are oftentimes those who want to also be more micromanaging. So maybe that's why in my head, and I think it's an interesting uh, phenomenon here that these two, to me, they feel related and correlated. So I'm glad you made that differentiation. So there are te- technically in your perspective, there are two different things. One has different root cause, another one has another. Uh, and I think it's important for folks um, to really be aware and like, oh, if they are practicing any of that uh, with their teams. Uh, I am kind of aware of like uh, the time. I want to know um, for your mental health, you're doing uh, walking and uh, daily walks. Uh, you're putting on amazing podcasts like the ally show on and you listen to those mm-hmm. what are some of the other things that you do for your mental health to make sure uh you can be the best version of you um i'd say the walk has really been the best thing that's happened so far uh, but one thing i'm trying to do is um realize that you know i'm not the amount of work that i'm sitting and doing in front of the computer is not what I am that's not who I am necessarily and I think in the nine to five jobs we're taught hey from nine to five you sit at your desk and you work and um, I'm finally I'm realizing that for me it's you know taking some breaks and disconnecting my brain helps me be more creative and come up with things that you know are really more impactful and you know can 
focus on creating posts out of nowhere for LinkedIn because I'm not sitting down. And I've noticed that as I'm sitting down you know, for two hours at a time on my desk and working, I'm not making much progress. I, I, I could probably be taking you know, an hour break and come back and do the same amount of work because now my brain hasn't been fried, you know, the way to say that. I like what you were saying about like, just doing a lot of that work off the laptop. Like uh, one thing that I've been also practicing in the last year almost is like, I sort of made this uh, force for myself that like, hey, open the laptop when you have something to do actually. Like when you have an idea to work on or when you want to browse something that you know what. Because before that, I I was uh, feeling that I was just in laptop all the time. To your point, like my definition was, yeah, I'm working, I'm busy because I'm behind the laptop. And I never use the screens. As you remember, I always only had my laptop, even back in the uh, before COVID time. And it was just my thing. Like when I was opening my laptop, that meant I was working. Whereas now I have a bunch of notebooks here for different purposes. So if I have an idea about a specific thing that goes into that notebook, I figure it out. I like put it down like and play around with it. And when it's done, I'm like, oh, okay, now what do I need to do? I need to search for this, that, and then email Tudor about this. Great, done. And I use this only when, and it, it sounds pretty simple, but it's, it's life-changing. Like I'm literally spending a lot less time behind the laptop and I'm only using it when I, when it's needed. This is also a good reminder for me to do the same thing with my phone. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And I know a lot of us are dealing with that too. So it's like this awareness that why do I need this tool for? This is built for a good reason, but why do I need it? It's not the definition of me. It has to be in my service and how am I going to use it? So uh, I, I love what you called out and it was a good reminder for me to be aware of my phone usage these days. Uh, and at the end of every episode and every conversation, we ask our guests to um, introduce an accountability campaign. If there is any activity that you would like to be doing with some of our listeners for 30 days, what would that be? Um, I would say, you know, besides the walks, I recommend everybody to do that. Uh, I, you know, it's helped me uh, greatly, even if it's a 30 minute walk. Um, I would say the other one is, um, you know, take some time away from the desk um, and try to see, because your productivity is not defined by how much you type on a keyboard or you look at a screen and see what comes up when your brain is free to think. Um, kind of like the shower thoughts you have, right? Um, things, creative things come up there and um, that's where strategies are born. And, you know, spend, you know, start with like 30 minutes, maybe move it to an hour away from the screen and um, see what you can come up with in a notebook, you know, journal, doodle, whatever you want to do. So they are technically, they can choose what they want to do, but not on the screen. Like they can go cook even, yeah. right? Like. But the time that was yep. supposed to be spent, usually as their regular daily plan, if it was spent on the screen, take that off, 30 minute, one hour, do something else, do journaling, do doodling, cook, walk, look at the outside and just like people watch, like whatever, whatever that comes to your mind, do that. I love that. And I will definitely do it. Uh, I've been... I can do it on my phone if you don't mind. I will, I will cut my phone usage with that approach. I really appreciate it, Tudor. Before we close out, is there any final thought, anything that you want to you say about the conversations we had, uh, anything missing? I would love to hear that. Um, no, I think it's been really fun um, chatting with you, Ali, and um, glad to be on your podcast. I really appreciated the conversation. Thank you so much for showing up. Thank you for the time, and I hope everyone enjoyed this conversation. Have a wonderful day, Tudor, and have a wonderful day, everyone else. Right. Thank you.